Well, my full name, I think my dad must have been a bit intoxicated, is Joseph Nathaniel Walter Augustus Eady. <laughs> Not a lot of people know that, so you can consider yourself, you know, one of a few. But basically, Joseph Eady, or Joe, as most people call me. I live in South East now, in Catford, whereas this is South West. Um, but when I first came here as a lad, when I was 10, um, we lived in uh, South Lambeth, just uh, Vauxhall, South Lambeth, which is just up the road. I remember actually in those days, it cost, I think, a penny, one and a half P of old money to get to Brixton. But uh, Brixton obviously is, was the centre or the epicentre of the black community in those days. And it's quite interesting, I, my work when I left school, I got an apprenticeship with British Telecom and part of my training, you do an apprenticeship course, I was on a group known as Subscribers Maintenance, which was uh, repairing uh, in the Clapham area, uh, Vauxhall area, switchboards, telephones, what have you. And one of the places I remember going was uh, in Clapham North Tube Station, underground station, having to go and repair a phone down there. And um, it was in an area which apparently was used during the war as like an air raid shelter. And there were thousands of beds, you know, two, three stacked up on either side of the tunnel. And the story goes that apparently in the early days after the war, when a lot of West Indians started to come here, uh, that's where a lot of were housed because most of them probably didn't have any family because they were the first and didn't and you know there used to be signs no dogs no Irish no blacks so they were housed there and the reason being in Brixton you you had um, a, uh, a what you call it a labor exchange so it was easy access to go to find a job uh, but as I said we lived in Vauxhall but um, to get our sort of West Indian uh, food produce, i.e. yam, banana, things like that. The only place you could get it back in those days was, the, you know, coming down to Brixton. And, you know, I used to go down there with my mum to do shopping on a Saturday and so on. And then, um, you know, after uh, leaving school and becoming an apprentice, then you'd go down to Brixton. I was always interested in um, music. So I'd you know, with working for one pound in those days, you could buy three singles or a 45 as they were known. You could get, they used to be six and eight, six shillings and eight pence each. So for a pound, you'd, you could buy three. And on the Atlantic Road, there used to be a very, uh, Desmond Hip City, a very famous, at the time, uh, record store. And uh, on a Saturday afternoon, everybody, you'd see all your friends. And if you wanted to know where you were going Saturday evening, you'd find out where all the parties were because, um, I don't know if anybody else said it, you know, and we didn't really have a lot of clubs or things like that in those days, so it was usually house parties or birthday parties, and, but you'd meet in Brixton on a Saturday and just walking around seeing what your friends and so on, uh, you would find out where the party was and where you'd be, you know, going to socialise. Um, hello, uh, I, when I first got here, as I said, I only spent three months in a primary school uh, up by near the Oval. Um, God, I've forgotten the name of it. But anyway, it was only three months. And then I remember in, uh, you know, getting a letter from school saying that I would be um, going to Kennington Secondary Boys' School, which was just off the Brixton Road, Hackford Road. And... Um, in the first year, I'm sure there wasn't more than probably, first year I was there, probably no more than maybe 15, 20 uh, black kids in the school. Um, and some of my friends till today actually, I, I still keep in contact with one and two of the boys I met then. But by the time I reached the third, fourth year, the school was then 80%, you know, of the immigrant kids that had, had come up. Well, um, you know, I left school at 16 and um, I 
Yeah, an interesting point, actually. I remember the careers officer, I told him I was interested in, you know, telecommunications, electronics. And there used to be a company in West Norwood called TMC, Telephone Manufacturing Company. And I went for an interview there, got through the interview, but the, um, the interviewer said to me, we've taken on all our apprentices in the telecom side. Uh, you would have to spend a year in our mechanical engineering side for a year and then you could transfer to our telecom side. But I was wasn't never interested in uh, mechanical engineering. So I went back to my careers officer and you know and told him this. And the, the thing I find interesting in relation to today is that uh, this was about maybe four or five weeks after school had broken up the summer. I met another friend and he was back at the careers office and he was back on his third job. He'd been to two, didn't like it, but it was that easy to get employed in those days. He's already, he had already had two jobs in the five weeks and wasn't you know, happy with them and was back there to try and get a third one. Anyway, um, they then said uh, to me that uh, uh, in those days it was GPO, General P Post Office, or British Telecom as it is today, that they're um, recruiting, perhaps, you know, we apply to them. And uh, I remember we sent off the application and they wrote back and said, um, yes, you know, to come for an interview, you'd, you'd be expected to answer. There was a paper, I think a maths paper and an English paper that you had to do. And you'd be expected to answer questions on dry cells, Leclanche cells, Ohm's law. And oh, I'd heard of, you know, the cells, but Ohm's law I'd never heard of. And I remember asking an English friend of mine, you know, he said, oh, I think it's something to do with um, electricity. So the Tate Library, which is in Brixton, there was also an annex up on South Lambeth Road. I remember going in there, getting a book out, and reading the Ohm's Law, what it said, you know, and I learnt it off parrot fashion. And I remember when I went on the interview, I got through the maths and the English side of it, and then I had a, an interview with a career officer, and three other gentlemen sat up, you know, on a big table, and I was the other side. And uh, they liked what they saw, because I also, see my story it starts from Jamaica. In Kingston, where I grew up, the church I used to go was the head Methodist church in Jamaica, Coke Methodist Church. The pastor had a, a deaconess, a lady that helped him with his um, daily services, that came from England. And when she heard I was coming to live in London, in Vauxhall, Fentiman Road, she said, that's where I grew up. And she said, I know the, the church on Fentiman Road. I know the pastor, and she wrote to them. So I came here on a Thursday, and in those days, it was the old propeller planes. It took two days. I remember we left on the 30th of April. We didn't arrive until the 2nd of May, two days to fly from Jamaica. That's a change, you know, to today. And um, the Thursday I arrived, by the Sunday when I went over there, everybody expected me, oh, Joe, Sister Dorothy Carey told us about your coming. And they welcomed me with open arms. And um, I grew up in that environment, Sunday school, boys' brigade, Sunday school teach. So my earlier teenage years was really, my friends were mainly the English friends um, from the boys' brigade and the church that I grew up with. Now, why did I tell you that? There's a reason in what I was saying before. But yes, uh, I, um, yeah, one of my friends from the Boys Brigade mentioned that Ohm's Law is something to do with electricity. So I learned up uh, what it meant and I memorized it. And in the interview, they said, um, what do you know about Ohm's Law? So I just quoted this um, law. And I remember seeing they looked at each other, oh, impressed, you know. And then they went into it a little further by asking me you know, how you would find the resistance of a circuit or the capacitance in a circuit. And I didn't have a clue. And I, <laughs> so I just, I just was honest. I said, you know, to be honest, when you sent me the letter saying I'd be expected to answer questions on this, I went to the library and I read it in a book, but that's all I know. 
And I think they looked at each other and said, well, at least he showed initiative. And they said, yep, you know, you can start as an apprentice. And, you know, back then, I never saw another black apprentice for, for years. I don't think, um, you know, in the southeast areas it was then, they had any black youngsters, you know, as an apprentice. So I wouldn't say I was the first, but I just, because we would go on courses and so on. Never used to see any. I remember once I saw an Indian chap, but never saw any black ones. But that was my early years anyway with, um, you know, in, in the country. Brixton, as I said, uh, for me, Vauxhall was about a penny and a one and a half P ride away. So I would go down to Brixton mostly on a Saturday. During the week, obviously, you know, school. And as I say, my early years was spent four for at least four times a week at the church with the boys' brigade activities or the Sunday school activities and so on. But yeah, that would be my early years of, you know, Brixton. And as you say, if, uh, friends that lived with us when I first came here, some bought their own places and moved down to Brixton. So, you know, we would go down there to have your hair cut and so on, the barber. Everything centred around Brixton. I think people used to come from all over London, you know, wherever they lived, to Brixton if you wanted anything uh, from the Caribbean, because that's where the market was and that's the only place you could get, uh, you know, West Indian produce at the time. And the music, of course. Oh, yeah, that's another thing, the music. Well, with me personally, I've always loved music. And where we, I lived in Kingston in Jamaica, say approximately 150 yards away, there was a hall, I think it was called Progressive. And on a weekend, uh, it would be hired out for dances. And one of my early memories, actually, is maybe being in bed on a... Sunday, early Sunday morning, Saturday night, and you could hear the sound system because at night, and it's clear, even 100, 200 yards away, it was clear, you know, hearing a lot of um, sort of blues American music. You'd, I mean, it wasn't uh, like dub like you have today. It was uh, blue beat, as they used to call it, and a lot of American tracks you would hear. And personally, I, I think I was more always inclined to soul music rather than reggae. I like reggae, but my love was really soul. I think the first uh, single I ever bought was uh, called High Heel Sneaker by um, Song of a Tucker, Song of a Tucker by High Heel Sneakers and uh, Tim and, and uh, Marvin Gaye. Um, how sweet it is to be loved by you. I don't know if you know that. I remember buying buying those. As, as I said, in those days, you could get three for a pound. So, you know, you go with your pound, you get three singles, and that's it for the weekend. You go home and you spin it. And I don't know how many of these interviews you're doing, but I'm sure they've mentioned the old blue spot radiogram that your parents used to have, you know, and Dad on a Sunday, he would be playing, wiping off the vinyl, putting them on. Mum would be in the kitchen. My personal job after coming from sun, Sunday school would be um, making sure all his shoes for, for work and his dress shoes were clean and my school shoes before I could go out and play, you know, on, on, on a Sunday afternoon. But that, I would say, again, is my early memories of a Sunday, you know, dad playing his music, mom in the kitchen and me making sure the shoes, you know, all his shoes are, are so cleaned before, you know, I could go out to play on a Sunday. Um, and how did that develop for you? You mentioned the mm. record store. Can, you, can mm. you tell me a bit about the inside of the store, like what they looked like, what kind of activity would go on in there, and like maybe the difference between some of them, because there are at least like six, were there around about six Well, the, the ones, as I said, I wasn't really into reggae too much, but when I used to go to Brixton, I would go to buy, you know, a few uh, records or reggae records. And also on the Saturday was like a social uh, centre where, you know, you'd meet up with all your friends and where the party was or what to do. Uh, record buying wise, though, because as I said, I was more interested in soul and jazz. I used to go over to the West End. To, there's a place on Charing Cross Road. I'm not sure if it's even there to this day. It was called Dobells, and it was totally different because in Dobells, the albums, you'd go and you'd 
they would say, oh, so-and-so jazz, and I like jazz, jazz organ in particular. And they'd say, oh, Jimmy Smith has got a new album? Yes, sir. And they'd hand it to you. You'd go into your cubicle, you had your little deck, your headphones, and you could play to your heart's content. And when you know, you're satisfied, you'd go back out and say, just you purchase it. Oh, no, I won't have this one. You'd have another one. Also, um, a lot of the soul music that I bought was from, uh, there used to be a shop in Ballam called Record Corner, which started out as a classical music shop. And uh, the owner, I think a young lad, came in who sort of changed the store 100% from classical music to soul. And they used to call up the States uh, regularly, daily, to find out what's new and have uh, these uh, records posted over, you know, they'd have them ear freighted over. And so the majority in, from the music side, I would say Balam and the soul music, the shop, uh, as I mentioned, called Record Corner, was like the hub. A lot of uh, other friends of mine, they would go to the West End, but with work that I did, I didn't have time, you know, during the week to do this because I worked in the the time it was called South East or South Central area and it didn't go across the river so I was based most of my work in life actually after the mentioning doing my apprenticeship I worked for a time on subscribers uh, maintenance and then I did exchange maintenance or switch maintenance in a telephone exchange in the Battersea area and that's where most of my work in life was spent um, and that's interesting as well because when I first went on the Battersea area, 228, as it, because I don't know if you realise this, for instance, Brixton, the first telephone exchange you had, the number was 274 and then another four digits. Well, the 274, if you looked at the old telephone uh, with the dial, you had A, B, C, D, E, F, you used to have. 274 is BRI, which was Brixton. So that used to denote the area. Battersea was 228. B was in two, uh, A was in two, and the T in BAT was in the circle of eight. So um, in the early days, I would say we probably had about 12, 12 well, each extension of up to 10,000, but I know we had two units, 228 and 223. So we had probably about 14,000 subscribers and we had a staff of about in the telephone exchange probably of about 36 38 guys doing different things but about that staff to maintain we used to have a switchboard upstairs with about 60 operators and uh, a lady in charge of the operators she actually was in charge of the building in those days but over the years they moved out they centralized them and put them elsewhere the equipment got modernised in the late 70s and only eight of us was trained up on the new equipment. The others, some was getting on, some retired, some went on other sections. But um, it was left to eight of us. And gradually over the years, that dwindled down until, until there was just three of us in there by the mid-90s. And with, uh, when BT um, uh, was privatised and other companies came in, new technology again. The equipment that used to take up the space of three floors of equipment, you could fit in a, a room, maybe, well, in, in, in feet, maybe, uh, say, 15 feet by 12 feet. All the equipment that used to take three floors can now be fitted in, some now in, in like a little cabinet. So they didn't need, uh, the amount of staff they had, say, when I started, and they started to downsize and made offers for people if they wanted to take, not compulsory, but voluntary, you know, redundancy. And um, I took that, oh God, time in 98, you know, so, um, but, you know, the majority of my work in life was, you know, with BT. Um, and then in uh, mm. thinking back to, um, just going back on what you were saying, you were yes. moving into soul and blues. Yes, yes. And um, so did that mean that when you were going out at night, you were going outside of Brixton, or was there enough catered to your kind of music? In Brixton? Um, for parties, majority would be in Brixton. But then I got, 
led astray in my late teens from, I told you I used to Sunday school, even Sunday school teach at this um, church on Fentiman Road. And a, a very good friend from school days, Trevor, that, a friend of mine called Trevor, that lives, lived local in Vauxhall as well. He heard of a place on a Sunday afternoon called the Flamingo, which is in the West End on Wardour Street. Now, Flamingo, uh, it was the best. Uh, in those days, records was played in the intermission. The main time you spent dancing or listening was to a band, Georgie Fame, Zoot Money, um, um, I see Gina Washington and the Ram Jam Band, I remember was another. You'd get American artist Rufus Thomas and a lot of American artists used to come and perform down at the Ram Jam. Um, the and Ram Jam was in Brixton. Ah. Uh, different, different Ram Jam. Yeah, sorry, it was the Flamingo in, um, it's Gina Washington and the Ram Jam Band. And I think actually the Ram Jam that you've heard about that was in Brixton, I think that came from the guys that used to run the Flamingo when they opened in Brixton, they called it the Ram Jam, like you say. And yes, I've used to, first of all, as I said, it used to be the Flamingo in Wardour Street. But then when the Ram Jam was open, yes, I used to go there as well. Some very famous people, I remember seeing um, Nina Simone down there, you know, which way, way back in the day. And, she, you know, she was brilliant. But I always remember a, a, a story, well, a fact, the night she was there, and everybody knows my baby don't care for me by her. But obviously she's not just a one song woman, you know, she's got a big repertoire. And she was trained as a classical pianist. So she was going into this classical piece. And I always remember this guy shouted out, I'll do it as he said, Lego that and play some reggae. And she just stopped you know, and gave him a really fierce stare and said, if you do not like this, and I won't say four letter word, you can go and continued, you know. But the thing is, the majority of the folks only knew her for that one song. So the rest of her works, they didn't really appreciate. But yeah, I remember seeing her at the Ram Jam. But uh, yes, club wise, uh, because I was more interested in soul, uh, and most of the kids, actually, it was quite interesting because on a, uh, a Sunday afternoon, they had a, what they call a three to six session. So my Sunday school would start at three and finish at four. Then I'd rush down to the Oval with a couple of friends, get on the train to Leicester Square to go for the three to six session. We would then come out, we'd find a McDonald's or somewhere to eat, walk around for an hour or so, and then they had a seven to 11 session. And that's what we were doing at 11 o'clock. Everybody would get on the train at Leicester Square again. Some would get off at the Oval. Uh, there was no station in Brixton those days because it was just the Northern Line. So either the Oval, Stockwell, Clapham North, they would get off and make their way. But that was a regular Sunday afternoon, East stroke evening thing, you know, that would go on. As I said, I was always interested in soul and um, one of my same Trevor that I mentioned, his brother, um, he used to build amplifiers for the sound systems. You've heard, I don't know if anybody else mentioned, but you have lots of sound systems because, as I said, um, people would have house parties because, you know, there weren't any clubs or places for them to go. And these guys that came up, they would, you know, have their album and they would have their sounds and they'd play out at different parties. Well, growing up in, in my teens, as I said, we used to follow Hello, Trevor's brother, Errol, who um, built these uh, amplifiers, because whenever he built, he would go to listen to see what, how and what needed tweaking and changing. So we would go with him. And after doing this for a couple of years, uh, myself, Trevor and another friend decided we would like, you know, to have our own. And, um, you know, I said to them, you know, there are all these sounds out there, but all of them are reggae sounds because in those days, that's all there was. I said, why don't we come out as a soul sound, you know, play soul? And they weren't too keen, but I convinced them because the records I was buying was 
mainly so. And, uh, and, you know, we just had a different idea. For one thing, we thought we would have a consort with two decks. But those days, all the sounds just, you'd have the amplifier stack on one another, built high, and then you'd have the one deck on top, and he would play it, take it off, somebody would speak in between, and put another one on. But I said, you know, we could come up with a proper consort. We had two decks and all the equipment. So we did that. And... Um, we started to play at parties, house parties and so on. And where we lived on the South Lambeth Road, there used to be uh, a youth centre called Lansdowne. It's just in Stockwell. And we went to see the lady that ran it and asked if we could play. And she said, well, we did have a, a disco session on a Tuesday and we used to get about 30 kids. The chap who was doing this has left, but you know, if you like, you could start and, and take over and we did this and maybe after about she said I'd give you about six weeks and see how it goes and after the six weeks we were getting regularly about 50 kids coming so she was pleased she said oh well you can continue but this was in the old days when um, not Ilya GLC I think used to run all the you know the youth centers and she was very strict to the books uh, then, then she, she left. She wouldn't have more than 150 in the hall because it developed until we were getting 150 on a Tuesday night, until she gave us a Sunday night as well. So we used to do the Sunday and the Tuesday, and a, and a Tuesday. and kids would come from all over because from Brixton it's not far, it's just, you know, just up the road. And um, this went on till she left and then a young a uh, uh, gentleman just left uni, took over the running. And what used to happen was a lot of the kids would come and they couldn't get him because she would only allow 115. So they would be outside playing around and being mischievous. Now, John, when he took over, he said, you know, I'd rather them being inside than being outside. And he allowed them in. And on a Sunday evening in particular, we'd get between six and 800. Now this, in this hall, and um, it wasn't very big and the ceiling was low and they used to call it the sweat box because no matter how dry or dressed up you were, when you left by 11 o'clock on a Sunday evening, you, because the water used to just drip off the roof onto you. But it was like the center for the local, local and kids from far because um, I now live in Catford, and the only reason is because I met someone who lived, used to come down from Catford, you know, and told me because never that was like another world to go out that far in in those days. But um, you know, it, it was a it was a lot of fun. You know, it was a lot of fun. Lansdowne in particular, and a lot of the people that sort of know me would say, "Oh, we know you from Lansdowne, Joe." You know, when you used to play at Lansdowne, and um, the disco itself, being as I said, soul. Guys never used to like it because they wanted to hear the reggae, but they would come because girls love the soul. And just for the girls, but not for the music, they had all constantly, play more reggae, play more. I said, no, 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 this is a soul sound. You can go elsewhere to hear, you know, your reggae. But, um, yeah, we started at Lansdowne, and then from there we played at a lot of Mecca, Mecca gigs. Up in Streatham, the uh, bowling alley, we used to play there a lot. Uh, anybody that hired the bowling alley, we knew the manager and we would get the job as the disco. And you know, we had everything. By then, I had to diverse and I had a huge record box of English records, you know, like Rod Stewart and Beatles and things like that. So we did, we played there for a number of years. And then we got another gig at um, the Bally High, which is above the ice skating ring in Streatham. And that is, well, was a, a huge success on a Friday night. We used to play there. And then we took over the podium, which is down by Vauxhall, Nine Elms Lane, for a number of years. And then moved on to Night Moves, which was in Shoreditch for quite a while as well. So um, with work and that, it's a very, very busy you know, life, but enjoyable so far. So how, how long mm. did the Lansdowne continue? Oh, Lansdowne continued oh, from the early 70s, I would say, four, I'd say for about five, six years, you know, and um, well, 
the, what, what happened in the end, actually, because we used to get a lot of um, older guys would come and they would go upstairs and play dominoes. Oh, for instance, Hot Chocolate, the group, in their early years, when the, that's where they used to rehearse. We used to know the member, Errol and the rest of them, Lansdowne on a Sunday evening. We would be downstairs playing, they would be upstairs. And um, yes, it, it continued for about six to eight years. And then a, another regional uh, director came down one night and some of the bigger guys were upstairs, I think, smoking. They said, no, we can't have any smoking in here. So that put an end to it. But that was, um, you know, back in those days, that was on a Sunday evening, it was the place to be. And you know, it was um, very, very good memories, you know, Lansdowne. So what, what years would that have been? Yeah, as I said, it probably would be from about 70 to early 70s to about the mid 76, 77, I'd say that we, you know, we were at Lansdowne. We were there for a number of years. My probably my other colleague could tell you, but my memory is terrible these days, you know, very, very bad memory. No, but, no. Um, but, so you know. what was the sound system? TWJ, Trevor, Willie and Joe. Or, uh, you know, we, because it, it started out, we were saying, you know, like you had TWA, um, Trans World Airways. So we ruled the sound waves. So, you know, that's the idea of calling us ourselves TWJ, Trevor, Willie and Joe, the three of us. And um, uh, you, you wouldn't know, but uh, Willie, for instance, his brother, Tony Williams, he was um, not the first. There was Steve Bernard before him, and uh, there was another guy. But he actually went on to host uh, uh, on BBC Radio London reggae time, you know, on a Sunday, because he got in, involved and interested in playing music from watching us. But one of us, uh, Willie, my, the W now disco brother, you know, he got interested in. The, because in those days, you pl the records you played, you'd have them in the box for maybe three months, then you'd take them out because there'd be a new supply, a new of ones come in. And so he took a lot of our older records and started his own thing until he, he got on onto the radio. There were other clubs as well, you know, as I said, apart from Lansdowne, because other discos started and some were like in Balham. I know there used to be another club in Balham that, you know, that did that as well later, but I'd say Lansdowne, and especially for the uh, style of music, the soul music, I think we were probably the first, definitely in South London, I'm, you know, I wouldn't say about North or West because I really went that far, but definitely I'd say in South London, our disco was the first to um, specialise in soul music and, you know, as I said, the guys used to complain that I do not play enough reggae, but that wasn't the point. Yes, you know, it, it's interesting how people, how people perceive or looked at you because I wouldn't say I noticed myself as being, you know, up there and people, you know, looking at, at us in, in that light. But uh, in later years now, when I meet people, um, they say, oh, Joe, you, you... Well, for instance, there's another lady I know who's doing, uh, trying to document that period as well. And she's doing it, I think, from an angle of uh, black women who, in spite of the educational system, have done well. I forgot what her second topic was. And her third is our disco, she said, you know, because she said, for instance, she used to come to the Lansdowne, the youth club, and um, we had on our consort on the front, my friend brother, he, he had gone to university and we wanted a sign and he said, oh, put TWJ, Centrus Paribus, which means in Latin, apparently, everything constant. And she said, she just remembered that because she went on to uni. She said, I remember you had this sign. And, you know, I was just fascinated. You know, these guys, you know, how could they, you know, think that? So people, again, for the music, the soul music, and like you say, they used to look at, well, I wouldn't say gods, but... They, you know, they used to think you were amazing. It wasn't something I, I would say I, at the time, observed or noticed. But in later years, you know, meeting up with friends that go back from those days, you know, they, they've mentioned it. And I said, really? Because I know for me, 
playing out was for the enjoyment we had. You know, there were guys, there's the three of us, Trevor, Willie and Joe, but uh, I don't know if anybody has mentioned the sound system, you have huge boxes. You needed a crew. It, you know, two or three of you just couldn't do it. And, you know, there were guys, there was at least half a dozen guys that would give us a hand. And they would come along, that we'd set up, and once we string up, you know, they'd go to the bar and just have fun, meet girls and have fun. Um, it wasn't for the financial reward, especially in the early days, because it's not like today you hear of Rodigan and these guys, they go and play and it's thousands. For instance, they go to Europe or they go to Japan. Um, we know we've played, I've played at the Lyceum. We used to do a lot of uh, weekenders. Um, Caster, which is very popular and well known. I think we did one of the first Casters. I remember going down to Caster to play for the weekend. Scarborough, we've been to Spain, a group, coach, two coaches, people to Spain for a week. Um, France, Isle of Wight, all of these things we were doing back in the late 70s, early 80s. But it was, it wasn't really for the financial reward, it was just enjoyed play. I personally just enjoyed playing music and seeing people enjoying themselves. Up to today, I can't dance, <laughs> but, you know. But um, you know, I enjoyed just selecting, especially soul records and jazz as well. But obviously, you can play jazz too much, you know, at um, parties or these things. But um, I, I never look at it like I was up there, you know. And so Carnival, that's the other one. We used, we were probably one. I remember we back in the day. It's not like it is today. So organised. So long as you got into the area before 10 o'clock in the morning, you could just drive the van. We used to, um, by Ledbrook Grove Station, there used to be a lady's toilet. And what we used to do was send somebody in to plug in the electricity, take out a bulb, plug in the electricity, and we used to set up just under the flyover. And oh, on, the, on, the, on the Sunday and the Monday, we would get thousands, literally on the pavement and to spill out into the road because I think in the end they thought it was blocking the floats going through but even before that actually the first time we went there there used to be a square and we used to play on the square I think now they have a stage and a band that play there but we, we hired a generator and we used to play on the square and for instance the first year they had problems you know with the riot we were on the square and I remember, because we had, as I said, we had to get there early before 10. And maybe it was about 12, 12.30, some guys came because we used to set up one end. We'd have the van that we took the equipment in and then the crowd would be the other end of the square. It was a grass square. And a guy came and said, oh, there's some problems up the road with some lads and the police. This was about after 12, I suppose. And then I think it was about two o'clock. There was just a rush of uh, people and they ran past where we were, standing up playing, to the other end of the square. And then the police that was following them ran and stopped where we were. And then they started to throw stones. We've never packed up so quick. I think we got everything back in the van in about two minutes and just drove out. And I remember coming home and watching it on the television, you know, that evening. And I think that was the first year they had real problems. I think it was 76, you know, down, you know, at the carnival. And we did that for a number of years. And uh, that used to be a lot of fun as well, you know, in, in the early years. But as I said, it was, for the, me anyway, it was more for um, the love of playing music. It wasn't for the, any financial rewards. You know, later on, it got better, you know, until, you know, as I said, we, uh, we got the club in, uh, in Shoreditch. But, um, I never looked at myself as any, you know, different. But you're right, I, I know, especially young guys, because I think in the early years, in the late 60s and 70s, I'd say 90, 95% of young black boys had an affinity to a sound system. If it's even just to take in the record box or help them with the speaker, they would have their favorite sound and they would follow that sound, whatever. Music, I think, has always been um, a major part of, uh, you know, most young West Indian lads. 
I'm not, I'm not sure about today. I'm not really into it that much, but definitely I'd say when we were growing up, um, most had an affinity to one or the other sound. And the, you know, there were lots of the reggae sounds which were more popular to the guys anyway than us. But I know the girls liked you know, the soul music because the atmosphere was different. A lot of the functions we played, and you know, we, a, lot, a lot of places we play, they probably wouldn't have a reggae sound because of the so-called um, perceived problems that you get sometimes with the guys who follow it, you know? We used to do a lot of uh, occasions in the West End, you know, hotels and all over the place, you know, that we played. But yeah, so, it was good. So did you, because uh, as I understand it, it was quite a lot of competition between all the different sounds. Did, yeah. That if yeah. you had a completely different sound, did you manage to bypass that? Yes, yes. But it's, it's quite interesting you, ma you mentioned that because um, there are two, in, two uh, you know, instances I, I mentioned. One, we played at, um, at the Lyceum Strand, and that was a sound clash. I think it was Coxon, Tubbies, and I forgot, there's about four, and us. Now, we're not clashing with any reggae sound because we had reggae records, but you know they would have what they call pre-release. These are ones they get specially cut for themselves, so you know we couldn't match them with that. And I remember us trying to remember, uh, and there was a soul uh, record. It's a soul jazz, jazzy soul record by Herbie Mann called um, Memphis, um, no, Soul Underground. And it's, uh, he plays the flute. It's a beautiful rhythmic song. And, um, but I started it by playing a bit of Bach, organ, concerto. So I remember it was in a strand and we started da 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 and people were looking around, what is this? But then because we had the two deck, we could blend in the Memphis underground into it, you know? And, oh, you know? But we couldn't clash or compete with these guys, you know, as you say, a sound clash. And uh, another incident, actually, at the Oval, there's a place called Oval House, and I remember one Christmas um, they'd asked us to come and play. And it was us and another big reggae sound called um, Sufferer. Very, very good. I um, don't know if you've heard of Dennis Bavel. You've heard of Dennis? Well, he used to be their um, DJ, you know, and thing. And that was the first time we were meeting Dennis and Sufferer. You know, they'd hired them to do the reggae and us to play the soul at a Christmas dance. And um, I remember that night, we got there early because, you know, we were very efficient. It was starting at 7.30, I believe. We were there from 4, four o'clock, trying to find a, uh, strategic places to play, place our speakers so we'd get the best overall acoustics for the hall. You know, we had, we had our boxes. We had, um, you know, the treble boxes and the mid-range above them. Tested it out perfect. And, you know, we started to play. Sufferer turns up about quarter past seven, starting 7.30. And quick, 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 you know, they set up and we noticed there was like a, a, a balcony in the hall. Some of their lads climbed up and put a couple of speakers up well above everybody, you know, in the Oval House. And I don't know how, but a lot of the new records, I, I mean, I used to get imports directly from America those days. Somehow he had reggae versions of them. He had at least four or five songs, you know, and Dennis is a very good uh, MC. I don't know if you, how, if you know him. And he teased me, he teased us the nice, calling, so what you call yourself, you know, your butter, and he, he teased us. But it was healthy. It wasn't, you know, arrived because some of them, you know, the guys, they get ignorant and they fight. It wasn't anything like that. It was just more entertaining. So much so that we got Sufferer to play with us on a Sunday at Lansdowne because, you know, he had his crowd as well. And, you know, they were very popular. But we coexisted very, very good well, you know. And, yeah, that, that was two incidents with this sound clash thing. Never really clashed, but um, there are two instances, I, you know, I always remember the overlast with um, Sufferer with Dennis. And, um, as I say, um, this thing at the Strand, you know, playing at the Strand. There was another incident, actually, which I always remembered, is um, 
there's another huge sound up to today called um, jashaka. We used to, after a while, have a guest sound play with us down at the Lansdowne on a Tuesday. And we'd heard of this jashaka. He was from, I think, southeast London, I think, sort of Lewisham side. And so we invited him down. Uh, we always got there early. Uh, the kids used to come in about seven o'clock, but we'd be there for maybe six. So we'd strung up and set up and was playing. And what we would do is when the guest sound came in, once they'd set up, we'd let them test, give them maybe a quarter of an hour or so, 20 minutes to play a few, just to make sure everything was fine. And then we would do maybe two each, or well, I'd play one, then they would play one. So I, I was playing and then he said he was ready. So I said, okay, you know, you can play for your 20 minutes to make sure everything's fine. Played for his 20 minutes. And then I said, right, you know, we will now take it in turns. So I put a record on. Immediately he puts one on as well and just drown the sound of mine, you know, because he had more powerful amplifiers and more equipment. He just drowned, I said, so I said, I went on the mic, I said, um, you've had your 20 minutes, you know, we're going to do a 1-1. One, one. No, they, it was just totally ignorant at the time. And they did this for about, well, it just continued. In the end, we had to go to the mains and plug it out because people, Lansdowne is on um, South Lambeth Road. People from the housing estate near Wandsworth Road were complaining of the noise, the shaka. You know, I always I thought, what an uncouth you know, guy, how can you do this? You've come as a guest to somebody's place. But, uh, you know, years after we got to know him, but at first I thought, just different, you know, but that's how they were. They had to show that they were better than you, you know. It was the thing, but, you know, to me, it wasn't, uh, to me, entertaining and pleasing the people was what I found entertaining. Not saying, you know, I'm louder than you or so and so. But yeah, there were three, in, you know, in incidents that, I always remember. You know. Lots of times we used to go out to Godwin Inn, out in past Guildford and play on a Sunday evening. Uh, we used to play in Margate on a Thursday night. I'd leave work, change, pick up the lads in the van, drive all the way to Margate, play, come back in four o'clock in the morning, get up at 6.30 to go work. Couldn't do it today. But um, yeah, South End, we used to play in South End, Sittingbourne, all over the place. You know, we used to get jobs during the week as well. Yes, it, you know, in those days, as I said, weekends, Friday nights, well, Bally High, wherever, Saturday nights, we would get a gig, you know, a party, a wedding, or something like that. And even Sunday nights, we used to play a lot on a Sunday night. We'd do that, get up Monday morning, no problem. Actually, Monday evenings is usually when I'd stay in and have a rest. But again, we used to play in Margate on a Thursday, South End on a Wednesday night. I know we used to play down in um, Sheppey as well at one time. But um, it wasn't a problem, <laughs> you know. I think it's a mental thing, as I was saying, you know, as well, because now just the thought of it, <laughs> I'd be feeling tired, <laughs> you know. But um, back then, it was very good. It was, and as I said, it was more the love, just the enjoyment. We, the guys that were with us, um, just a good group of guys. And I used to go football, that's right. They used to get up and go. Sometimes we'd actually leave the party. We'd take our kit and go and play on a Sunday morning. We used to play for Lewisham Way and Brixton B.I.s. You know, with cricket. Yeah, you could do that. Whoa. So when um, I sort of boom the late 70s, early 80s, yes. as the tension started to rise mm -hmm. in Brixton, particularly mm. between the police and the local community, mm. did that alter the way that you were able to put on parties or sound systems? Um, personally, it didn't have any effect on me. Um, because, as I said, I lived, <coughs> I grew up in, in Vauxhall, used to go down to Brixton, but then uh, in, the, in the 80s, I'd moved up to Catford. So, personally, the riots and what really was going on in Brixton at that time, I wasn't really experiencing any, any of it. I would see it probably like, well, you were, you were too young, but I would be seeing it on the television more than experience. I know some of my friends that were directly, for instance, like Devon and so on, you know, they were 
involved personally in, in, in it. But I, 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 can't, I didn't have that, experience, that personal experience with it. You know? And it, it, it's interesting, uh, when you were speaking earlier with um, Errol, last week when I came down, after we left, Devon and I, we went down into Brixton by the Pop, Pop, what's it called? Um, Pop Brixton. Pop Brixton, yes. And, you know, I come to Brixton now and again, but the transformation of Brixton, I think, is amazing. You know, in a positive sense, um, because obviously, you know, the riots and those times, it was a little... Not want to say dangerous, because it depends who you are, but you probably would feel sometimes, especially at night when it was dark, maybe a, a little uncomfortable. But it was just refreshing last week, you know, when I went down just to see how it's transformed. The markets that used to go to get your West Indian food, and so in the evenings now, one they're all little restaurants outside. The other one, they're boutiques, they're restaurants, and the other eateries. It, it's it's just. Pity it wasn't like this <laughs> then, because um, I suppose it's economic reasons why, but um, it would have been good if they could have invested in it the way they have now, back then. Because I think a lot of it, and um, I, I think a lot of it with the, like I mentioned to you when I left school, how a friend I'd met, within five weeks he was on his third job. I think the unemployment situation in Brixton for the young black kids, uh, well, there wasn't any employment, a lot of them. The school let them down. And um, similar thing that's, uh, you know, I, I come and go to the States quite a bit these days. And I was reading a report this lawyer had written about, I think it's Michigan, and she said the area used to be a, a car manufacturing area, but you know, since the Japanese cars came in, it's closed. Maybe something like 100,000, and the majority of them were Negroes, blacks. There's no other development, no other um, manufacturing industries have come in there, no work, so the kids are growing up. There's no employment for them, and especially when you're young, if you're idle, you're full of energy. What are you going to do? And you know, with the police harassment, as you know, the searching and stopping, things like that. So a lot of it is caused, I think, by you know, the government not having the foresight to know, well, if you've got all these youngsters leaving school, unemployment is higher than most other places, what are they going to do? You know, so a lot of it, I think, uh, our government could uh, have and should deal with it, you know, in a more enlightened way. And, you know, think of schooling. I, I think um, they, they could do a lot more. Um, because even with, like, it, in my day, uh, in Jamaica, the schools, uh, you leave junior school and then you go to a secondary school. And now secondary school have all the grades. And I think in the early days, our parents didn't really understand the school system here too well. So, for instance, when I got a letter to take home, oh, Joe will be going to Kennington Secondary School. Oh, that's great. Secondary school in Jamaica, they know it. They probably think it's the same. And I only spent three months in a, a primary school because I came up and started in May and by June, July, you know, school in the term. And I remember we used to have um, like mental arithmetic tests, you know, spelling or mental arithmetic. And some of the kids in the class, I thought, oh, you know, they don't know that. And yet they went to the local grammar school, which was Archbishop Tennyson on by the Oval. Yet they sent me to Ten um, Kennington. Now, yes, in later years with BT, you know, because they used to send me to college, you know, one day a week and night school. But I'd say my schooling could have been better had my parents had more knowledge of the school system here. And especially you know, when I first came, you know, I, I think they just, a lot of our parents didn't really understand um, how it worked, the school system worked. It's changed now. Now I think, you know, because I, you know, I, I, for instance, I have a son and I made sure he had, you know, a good start. 
but yes, um, that is something as well. I think the education system fail a lot of our, our kids. They say they're just, for instance, this thing about disruption, a lot of black boys are disruptive. It's because a lot of them are, are quite bright and they're not being challenged, you know, education wise. And that's why they get up to me. My son, for instance, I remember I had him in a little prep school and every term the teacher would write, yes, his grades are good, but Anthony is disruptive in class. And I thought, but he's not like that. But what it was, I think there was about half a dozen of them, they used to compete to finish. And they would finish and then start to play. And that was a disruption. He then took an entrance exam into a very good school and got in. And once he was there, never got that complaint in because they really worked them. Didn't have time to, um, you know. So, you know, a lot of it when they say the kids are mischievous or disruptive is because they're not being uh, educational wise challenged uh, which is sad really what lessons do you think need to be learned from that from that period of time i mean it's it's a really broad mm -hmm. question that but yeah. is, is there any particular things that you think really need to be remembered in order to sort of develop and not make those kinds of mistakes again well I, with, with that i'd say it, it's more the parents and you couldn't blame the parents back then because the pioneers or the early uh, uh, generation that came, all the, because of how difficult it was to really get on here, all they could probably to concentrate on is just to make ends meet, you know, having a roof over their head. Um, they have family back home, probably had to be sent into support as well. The kids, you know, that they brought up. And, and where their children education is concerned, I think they didn't understand the system. So they probably didn't even have time to go to um, open days, you know, to speak with the teachers. And you know, this is another thing, if the teachers do not see you, they won't have an interest in your child. If you go up and says, oh, you know, what's going on? They say, oh, I don't want Mr. So or Mrs. So-and-so to come here and give me any grief. And they'll keep an eye and focus more on that child. So it wasn't really their fault, but I think they didn't really understand the system. What I think is sad is ones, let's say, who have been through the system and know it and still are not putting an effort into their children education. You know, I think some could do a lot better, you know, where that's concerned, you know. But then, again, as I say, my friends and so on, I know they all um, have taken an interest, a keen interest in their children, and, you know, and, and they've done well, you know, done quite well. Yeah, well, personally, like you say, the weekends, you just mentioned what you did, just remind me of something. Because when we were young, as I say, we'd go to Brixton on a Saturday and, you know, maybe you'd go to your mum, do the shopping and then she'd go off and you'd stay and I'd, you'd walk around, you'd meet up with friends. Hey, what's you doing tonight? Where is the party at? You'd go to the record shop. But also, especially when I started working, it's not like today where... I know if you go, they go to the shop and they buy a ready-made suit. You had Hepworths, you had Roseman. These were individual bespoke tailors, or Roseman was. You'd go and get your suit cut. You know, you didn't buy off the peg. Um, mohair, tonic mohair was, I remember, when that came out. Very expensive material. But most guys, you'd get a summer suit and you'd get a winter suit. You'd have two suits made to measure, not off the peg. Things like that. Like you say, for going out in the evenings, at a particular party, maybe a birthday or so, you had to look, especially Christmas, when it's coming around to Christmas time, you know you had to look the part for the occasion. And um, yeah, we used to do that. There were two or three tailors, you know, bespoke tailors in Brixton. And the people who'd come from out of Brixton just to visit these tailors, they were well, especially I know Roseman was, you know, and Hepworth, Burton was another one as well. But, you know, they were really, really, um, for the guys, I don't know about girls, but, you know, guy-wise, that's, that's the thing. And uh, as I say, especially Christmas, you must go and get a suit, um, you know, a, a, a suit cut for the Christmas. I have loads of suits. It's funny, actually, one of my, my son's um, uh, cousin had a, and this was in the eight, 
early 90s, he was going to a fancy dress thing and I had to give him one of my old suits, which I still had. And, you know, it's still fitted because, you see, I'm not, you know, I'm putting on too much weight. But, you know, it just, rem it brought, at the time, I said, oh, you can keep it, you know, because I, you know, I haven't worn this for about 20 odd years. But, um, you know, it just reminded me of, of the time, like you're saying, you know, growing up. Um, oh, yeah. It, I don't think kids are smart today. In those days, brogues, shoes, everything, you know, your, your, your suit, your shirt, special, special for, um, you know, for, for the going out to whatever, the party or the, especially the wedding, any sort of occasion, you know, you really dressed up, you know. Ah, but as I say, today, just memories you know when you started I was going to say what do you want the reggae version what about the half that's never been told which is a Dennis Brown song or do you want the Gladys Knight memories like the corner of my mind you know these are all it's good memories it's good what you're doing you know it's very positive it um, makes me you know reflect and remember you know I've touched wood I think I have guardian angels you know and I personally won't complain too much because even a lot of the issues that um, one and two friends I know have had, personally, I haven't, you know, even with the police and things like that, you know, I personally haven't had them, so, but I know it exists because I have friends who've, you know, been involved, who've been innocent and, you know, been, had problems, but, that, I mean, but yeah. That's what the whole project's about, it's about yeah. everybody's different kind of experience. Yeah. No, I was going to say, not with the police, but I know there is um, subliminal, institutionalised racism that, it, that goes on as well. You know, you see that in different areas, in work-wise. I remember the work, um, British Telecom, you know, we have a lot of colleges out in the country and sometimes you'd be sent away two, three weeks on a course. And uh, we have a thing they call it pre-course training, so you have a rough idea of what you're going to do. And if, say, someone from your group has been on that course before, you probably spend a couple of afternoons with them, going over some of the circuit diagrams and so, so you have a rough idea. And I always remember, I was going away on a course, and, um, you know, I asked, uh, uh, I thought, I would say a friend, but now I'd say more a colleague, said, oh, can you go over such and such with me, these diagrams? And he sort of said, yeah. And the day went by, two days, and the course was going to be the following week. So it's now Thursday and nothing had happened. So I said, um, Ted, you know, when are you going to do this? You know, I'm going away on Monday. He said, well, I don't want to do it, really. And I said, what do you mean you do not want to do it? He said, well, if I tell you, then you'll know as much as I do. Now, yes, exactly, and I never, that's something I'll never forget, you know, and I just kept my distance from him then, you know, so you, you, you do find it, and it's, you know, it's not everybody, but I'll, I'll, you know, it's something I'll never forget, he said, well, if I tell you, then you'll know as much as I do. Why does that matter, you know, we're, we're here, we're maintaining this equipment, you know, it's for, not for me, <laughs> you're telling me, you know, I'm not benefiting from it. You know, it's, it's for the job, but yeah. But, but overall, more about him yes, than anyone else. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Feeling, um, that he wasn't good enough, and that's, that's right. That's right. That's exactly. That's exactly. It was, depressing. It, was so depressing. it was. It was. It was. You know, I was shocked. You know, when he said, I said, "Did he really say that?" Never bothered him again. <laughs> you know. But yeah. Um, and you mentioned. Mm. Yes. And that you feel there's a lot of positive change. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Do you, do you feel it's something that, that the community is able to engage with, or is it something that's in a way kind of... Separate? Uh, separate, developed perhaps without a lot of the, the, a lot of the community that was living there throughout the 80s, 90s? Well, well, this is it. I think the community of the 70s and 80s, the majority have moved away, and... Um, whether you like it or not, it's, it's progress because the people that have moved in, um, a lot of them probably have had to pay premium price for their properties because, you know, Brixton is 
It's like it's so central to buses, tube, overhead train to get into central London. So these people that moved in, they're probably on an economic scale above the folks who were here. So that the new shops and boutiques that they're bringing in, a bit more upscale. So um, it's just a fact of life of economics, of um, capitalism, I suppose. You can't really get away from it. But, you know, I mean, was it, is it John Major used to live in Brixton? So obviously there was a time when maybe it was up there and then like everything else, you know, in life, it, you know, you, you're, you're new, you're born, you peak, you die off. It's a cycle, isn't it? Maybe it's the cycle of, of life. You know, other areas are changing. I've noticed Peckham's changed. I, I think what it is, it started obviously over in the other side of London, Chelsea. Then they moved into Battersea, into Clapham. This say it's going further and further out. You know, as uh, maybe transportation gets better, you find that because the thing that worries me actually is that uh, the folks of my generation who when you started work, you could save and you could get a mortgage and you could buy a place. Our kids cannot buy in London. It is now out of their price range. They've got to move further out. And they're moving further out. If you're working in London, then you're going to pay the heavy, expensive fare cost. You know, it's a catch-22 situation. It's not, um, you know, easy for them. No, no, yeah, yeah, you know, unless their parents, you know, have a little, or the grandparents leave them something, they won't be able to um, afford anything in London. And, you know, that's sad. I th I, you know, and the government should do something about it, whether they, it means building more houses and cheaper house, affordable houses, because you can't drive out all the, you know, folks, younger ones who were born and live here. But, you know, it will happen. Or there will be problems again. You know, because when it reaches to a breaking point, then, you know, you, you get problems.